It's been several years since the breakdown of talks between Palestinians and Israelis. Now come two new initiatives. Can they reignite prospects for peace? Hello, I'm Arnold Naidu and this is The Heat. Hopes for a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict are in, quote, serious danger, according to France's foreign minister. The comments were made last month at a conference attended by more than 20 countries aimed at reviving the long-stalled peace process. Israel was quick to reject the effort, saying that the best way to resolve the conflict is through direct bilateral negotiations with the Palestinians. Fast forward to earlier this month when Egypt's foreign minister visited Israel for the first time in nine years, bringing with him a new peace initiative, one that seemed to be greeted with more enthusiasm by the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Later we'll talk with an Israeli and a Palestinian about the latest prospects for peace, but we begin with CCTV Stephanie Fried in Tel Aviv and Adel El Mahruki in Cairo. And Adel, there are reports that Egypt offered to host direct confidence building talks between the Israelis and the Palestinians. What do we know about that proposal that the Egyptian Foreign Minister Sameh Shukri presented to the Israelis? Well, basically, it's um, the same approach Egypt has always took um, to the wards the um, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, the Egyptian um, um, intelligence or the Mukhabarat has been um, the key uh, negotiator between um, both Palestinian factions, whether it's um, the PLO or Hamas. Um, and at the same time, they have direct contacts with um, Israel officials so, um, to discuss um, these talks. Um, for um, months, we've seen um, President El Sisi trying to um, reattempt to revive um, these talks. So basically, Egypt is at a stage where it's independently talking to all parties. And once there are solid points to be built up uh, for um, direct talks, Egypt uh, will probably be taking um, the lead in hosting these talks here, maybe um, in the Sharm el Sheikh city, where um, it was used to have um, similar meetings and similar um, negotiations between Palestinian officials in previous years. Stephanie, by all accounts, Israel has not rejected Egypt's proposal. So where do things stand from Israel's perspective? Well, on, on publicly, from the outside, everything looks very warm. It looks very positive. Uh, certainly, we are seeing Mr. Netanyahu standing next to Egypt's foreign minister, smiling uh, from his office or from his ministry. We're hearing statements that the prime minister welcomes Egyptian President al-Sisi's initiative for peace. Bear in mind here that Egypt has been a major player in historically between the Palestinians and the Israelis whenever there's been forward movement between the sides. But again, uh, it, it looks very positive from the outside. Mr. Netanyahu, as uh, Adel said in Cairo, he's also entertaining the idea of going back to this 2002 Arab League proposal, which would call for an independent Palestinian state, peace between Palestinians and Israelis, and in exchange, Israel would get peaceful relations with Arab neighbors in this region. But on the flip side, on the inside, what we're not seeing are the skeptics and the critics that are saying that very possibly this is external, and that Mr. Netanyahu is smiling and looking as if he's moving forward or willing to move forward with the Egyptian proposal. But this is a way of off-putting the French initiative, which he has absolutely flatly said he's not, uh, not wanting to go forward with, and also to push off international pressure, quite frankly, pressure to continue moving forward, forward momentum. So there are some critics that are saying that perhaps it's not as positive as we're seeing on the outside. Anand? Adil, what's the mood in Cairo? Is there optimism that this initiative might jumpstart talks? Well, basically, it is the same as um, many other initiatives that have been, or attempts from um, the Egyptian government to approach for a peaceful solution um, and a two-state solution uh, for the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. But mainly this time, what has been quite um, 
remarkable about um, the wordings or the phrases used by Egyptian officials, whether it is the um, Egyptian President Abdel Fattah Sisi or the Foreign Minister Sameh Shukri, is that both have stressed very um, uh, clearly that Israel's uh, peace and Israel's safety is um, a, a, an important and integral part of this process, which has been an, a wording that is not very um, common in previous um, uh, Egyptian officials' um, direct statements or public statements before, particularly if we're talking about the, 30 dec the three decades uh, for pre former President Hosni Mubarak. So that's a first step that, yeah, or first time that Egypt will be clearly standing by um, the safety and um, the, the peace for the Israeli people in general. These are words that have never been um, heard before. Stephanie, much has been made of the tense relationship between Prime Minister Netanyahu and the US President Barack Obama. Any sense from the Israelis whom they would favor um, in the upcoming election, who might be more helpful to the peace process from their perspective, Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump? Preliminarily, essentially, what it is is the predictable versus the unpredictable, and that would be Hillary Clinton, who Israelis know. She was the Secretary of State under President Obama. She was the Secretary of State when there were direct negotiations between Palestinians and Israelis. She knows the region. She knows the players. There's a comfort level there for Israelis. On the flip side, there's Donald Trump, who people don't know, and they're not sure if they trust um, what he's saying. This is, this is what's coming from polls here. Uh, they also don't know about his experience level, and they're not sure. He's, he is unpredictable, and they feel that some of his statements are unpredictable. He's, quote-unquote, a wild card. Just to sum it up, though, recently in a poll, most Israelis uh, think that Donald Trump would do better for Israel than Hillary Clinton, but most Israelis would like to see Hillary Clinton, this is a recent poll, as president. Thanks, Stephanie. That's CCTV's Stephanie Fried and Adel El Makruki reporting. Joining us from Jerusalem to talk about the prospects for peace is Amots Asa El. He's a senior commentator with the Jerusalem Post. With us here in Washington is Leila El Haddad. She's an author, commentator, and advisor to the Palestinian Policy Network. And joining us from Los Angeles is Hamoud Salhi. He's an expert on the Middle East. He currently serves as Associate Dean at California State University, Dominguez Hills. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Hamoud, let me start with you. As we reported, the peace process broke down two years ago. So remind us again why we are at this situation right now. No peace process for two years. We are at stalemate. What happened? Well, actually, in more than two years, uh, there are a lot of things happening in the Middle East. There is the Arab Spring. There is a new threat uh, of uh, Daesh. Uh, there are uh, huge economic issues, uh, political issues, legitimacy of the Arab uh, uh, regimes. But what is significant in the last maybe uh, six months or so, even the last few weeks, that you have actually a movement, despite its limited uh, significance, uh, in the region, uh, discussing or talking about the prospect of jump-starting this process. Whether this is good or not it remains to be seen. We've seen, for example, a, uh, a meeting of the Arab League summit despite its failure in a workshop, which uh, it, its community finally uh, talked about uh, reminding the Arab world that the core issue is still the Palestinian-Israeli issue. We had the uh, uh, a visit of the uh, uh, Egypt foreign minister to Israel since the first since 2007, and there uh, there were some issues, but the issue of the Palestinian was raised. And then uh, on the top of that, you have the Paris uh, meeting. All of this were significant and a, a movement, but again, uh, the Palestinian-Israeli issue is very, very complex. So there are so many side issues that we need to consider, and it doesn't seem to be at the top of the agenda. The agenda today is how to deal with terrorism, how to deal with the issue of Syria, how to deal with the issue of Iraq, how to deal even with the issue of, the, uh, of Yemen, and on the top of that, the perception of right. the Iranian threat. Okay. Well, as you say, lots of things happening. Amos, from the Israeli point of view, what is it going to take to get this peace process back on track? I think that uh, Hamoud is very right that there are, the region is rife with uh, distractions um, that uh, overshadow the agenda right now and simply leave neither time nor patience for, for what has now emerged as a marginal issue in the region. We're talking about a region that stretches from the shores of the Atlantic to the shores of the Indian Ocean and, and houses or inhabits uh, some 300 million people. 
and the travails of uh, an aggregate 10, 12, 15 million uh, Israelis and Palestinians simply dwarf compared with uh, the mass killings uh, in Syria, in Iraq, and in Libya, and in Yemen, and the challenges to uh, the uh, time-honored regimes in these and other countries in the region, and the severe economic problems uh, in the region's uh, most important country, Egypt, and also even in the Gulf states, and in these general circumstances, I don't see, I don't see um, the um, magic wand that will suddenly change the agenda and also uh, reinvent the situation between the Israelis and the Palestinians any time in the near future. Right, Leila, the Egyptian foreign minister uh, met with the Palestinian president, Mahmoud Abbas, as well as the Palestinian chief negotiator, Saeb Erekat, among others. There's been talk of setting up a working group. That working group will, of course, include the Israelis and the Palestinians, as well as Jordan and the Egyptians. And what it would do is develop what's been termed confidence-building measures. Mm -hmm. Is that a good start? <laughs> I mean, sometimes I look at these actors and these players that are, be it the countries like France or others uh, in the region, and I wonder, do they have amnesia, or is it just a case of there's been so much invested in this process without actual peace, um, which is more of a sunk cost, that they, you know, the conventional wisdom seems to be that the more we throw into it money and time-wise, that perhaps, and ultimately something will come out of it, you know, to, but but it's just deja vu. It's like I feel like they're baking the same cake using different molds in a way. You know, every couple of years we have some new initiative or some new thing, term, you know, a road map, a confidence building measures or whatever, proximity talks and so forth, the French initiative. But, you know, ultimately without uh, exacting a cost, without holding Israel accountable, uh, nothing will change. We, I mean, and, and everyone knows the two-state solution, any prospect for a two-state solution is completely dead now. And, uh, and if governments aren't willing to hold Israel accountable, uh, then the citizens of the world and Palestinian civil society and others will by means of boycott, divestment and sanctions and so forth. When and you it, say hold Israel accountable, right. what would you like to see? I mean, I think uh, Palestinians made very clear they would like to see holding Israel accountable for its actions, meaning the ongoing uh, occupation, uh, you know, the, the settler colonial expansion and so forth, which has been going on since 1960, 40 years next year, uh, for its uh, war crimes uh, in the Gaza Strip among, amongst other places, these kinds of things. In other words, not drawing this continuous equivalency between right. Palestinian and Israeli action. You know, every sort of peace initiative that we have says, you know, and, and, you know, Palestinian violence and Israeli settlement expansion or so forth. Um, it needs to be very clear that this is a case of occupied and occupier. And you have to hold, you know, no amount of coaxing or proximity talks or whatever is going to convince Israel to stop its settlement uh, expansion, to stop attacking Gaza and so forth, to give up Jerusalem and, and allow the refugees uh, to return. It's, it's as simple as that. And I think the Egyptian involvement and so forth with Abbas and the visit to Jerusalem, I mean, really, it's just self-serving at this point. It's, it's more of a means of challenging uh, Turkey. I think it's a means for CC to be able to exert more influence, I think, in the region uh, to gain their assistance in, uh, in terms of combating what's going on in Sinai, and perhaps even viewing Jerusalem as a road to Congress and to the United States and, and being able to get uh, more aid from All the right. U.S. Almost, let me get your view on that, that Israel should be held accountable, that the occupation, as Leila says, should end. Oh, come on. Um, um, Leila just said that uh, no amount of, uh, of persuasion will make Israel, for instance, uh, stop the settlements. But actually, Israel did stop the settlements, for instance, in, uh, during the premiership of Eud Olmert last decade, when he placed on the counter in negotiations with uh, Mahmoud Abbas all the goods, uh, the territories, and he was just waiting for Mahmoud Abbas to sign on a map, and he wouldn't do that. And then even the hardline Benjamin Netanyahu later also agreed to uh, freeze for a set period of time uh, settlement activity. In other words, there were such Israeli gestures in the past, and there were such Israeli attempts uh, to come to terms with the Palestinians. This is even before we discuss the even more um, uh, outgoing and, and overarching uh, ways of uh, Shimon Peres when he was prime minister. It didn't work out, and our conclusion here in Israel in the face of all that was that the Palestinian interlocutors we face are at best willing to engage in deals that would be um, 
uh, intermediaries and uh, middle steps towards uh, a future complete dismantlement of the Jewish state. It's a grim conclusion, but it's a very practical one, and uh, one that is also very hard-earned. Amos, let me ask you this, because uh, part of what the Egyptian foreign minister was talking about was uh, a settlement based on the 67 borders. That, of course, would mean that there would be no Israeli presence in any of what is called the occupied territories right now. Is that something that Israel would be prepared to do, or is it a non-starter? First of all, his wording is based on and not, um, and not um, uh, completely um, um, equal to. Uh, there is a big difference between the two and the very principle of, of using the 67 uh, borders as only a basis for a remapping has been accepted by the Palestinian leadership. I mean, of course, the Palestinian leadership that is in the West Bank and not the Palestinian leadership that is in Gaza, which disagrees with the Palestinian leadership in the West Bank and is not willing to uh, even recognize Israel's existence. But if we discuss Abu Mazen and the Palestinian Authority who are based in the West Bank, they agreed with the principle of using the 67 lines only as a basis for future uh, adjustments in the border. Hence, the phrasing to which uh, the Egyptian foreign minister very wisely and pragmatically resorted to. All right, and I should just remind our viewers that Abu Mazen is also the name of President uh, Mahmoud Abbas. Hamoud, Can I'll, get, I'll yeah, get to you okay. in a moment, in a moment. I just want to get to Hamoud. Um, I mean, there are deep divisions here, as we've just heard, you know, on the question of settlements and the question of the status of Jerusalem, and we haven't even talked about the status of returning refugees. Let's look at the Palestinian side. They remain divided. There's a moderate leadership in the West Bank. There's Hamas in Gaza. Uh, is this an obstacle? How much of an obstacle is it to reaching a comprehensive peace settlement? Uh, it is a huge obstacle, and this is what uh, everybody tells the Palestinians. Uh, the Palestinians themselves uh, understood that that Palestinian unity is very, very important, uh, that uh, the Palestinian leadership should be on one page, that they should not be having internal fighting. Uh, that the, such a division that we have at this point hinder the movement for, forward of the, of the peace process. But we also should understand uh, that they should not, uh, this should not be used to uh, deny the Palestinians their rights and not to look into serious ways of moving uh, the peace process forward. What's happening in a lot of uh, areas is that the, the facts have changed on the ground. Uh, the, uh, the dynamics, uh, the movers, the leaders that, that move the peace process in the past or that move the, the peace process in the past have changed. The demographics in Israel have changed. The movement of about a million uh, 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 Russians coming after the collapse of the Soviet Union to Israel and establishing an Israeli identity changed the power. Uh, the Israeli leadership no longer talk about the normalization that Ishaq Rabin used to talk about, that Shimon Peres used to, to talk about, because of the realization that the Israeli mode today is that if we are secure enough, if we build walls, if we build our security system, we are going to be safe. Lala, go ahead. Well, one, nobody really cares what Mahmoud Abbas thinks or does anymore. He's completely morally and politically bankrupt and has no legitimacy amongst the Palestinians. And it's really the opinion of most Palestinians that the Palestinian Authority should be dismantled and Oslo should be disavowed. Uh, two, every peace process has been a smokescreen for Israel to continue its territorial expansion, you know, in line with its governing policies since forever, since its foundation, which has been territorial inclusion, demographic exclusion, right? More land, less Arabs. And so there's, I mean, there's no denying that. And there's always been a so-called partner for peace, but it's just the same court sort of, uh, uh, you know, phrases that are recycled by the Israelis uh, to be able to, uh, you know, forestall, postpone as much as possible any kind of negotiated settlement. Uh, there was never a mention of Palestinian statehood anyways in, in the Oslo mm -hmm. Accords, we all know that. Uh, and lastly, to, you know, we talk about settlement freezes and so forth. Again, a fiction. I mean, it's, it's all, how many more freezes do we need? I mean, it's been going on for uh, 20 years. Settlement, you know, expansion was at an all-time high under the Netanyahu administration in the 1990s, in, in the heyday of Oslo, right? And even in the past few years, we had thousands of new uh, settlers brought, um, you know, uh, by way of settlement expansion in Jerusalem, for example. Uh, so, I mean, again, all of this talk is completely absurd, completely bogus. We know that 
that settlement expansion is ongoing. And again, the only way to do this, to be able to stop this, is to be able to put pressure to hold Israel accountable. And if we're talking by, specifically, then, for example, withhold uh, uh, U.S. aid, which is in every, by every you know, measure, politically, economically, so forth, works against U.S. interests in any case. Amos, um, in a talking about Israel and its search for a partner, as it says, to negotiate with, uh, Israel has made it clear that it will not negotiate with any Palestinian delegation that includes members of Hamas. That sounds like a precondition. How does one overcome that? And I, you know, I, and I ask you that because I presume Israel would want to reach an agreement that is comprehensive that includes everybody. I will address that in a second, but first I have to make one correction to what Lila said. She said there was no denying that uh, Israel wants, has always wanted uh, maximum land and uh, minimum Arabs. That is unfounded factually because Israel, in uh, having gone to Oslo and in having later the Israeli voter, I mean, having later elected uh, Israeli leaders who said for the record that they want to um, see the West Bank in turn for peace. The Israeli voter, let alone the Israeli government, said plainly they want less land in turn for peace. So let's get that one accurate. Concerning Israel's attitude towards Hamas, it is not that it is disqualifying Hamas um, um, inherently and indefinitely. It simply says that negotiating with an entity that does not recognize Israel's right to exist is futile to begin with. What will we negotiate with them? The terms of our hanging? All right. Let me go to uh, Hamoud. If we look at the current uh, composition of the Israeli government right now, it's dominated by hardline right-wingers. We have uh, Avigdor Lieberman. He replaced Moshe Yalon as defense minister. He is currently, Lieberman is a defense minister who's once said that he wants to expel Palestinians from Israel uh, to the occupied territories. He wants to behead Arabs who show disloyalty to Israel. What chance of a peace settlement with men like him in the Israeli government? It's a very, very uh, serious question, and that speaks volume to where we are at this point. Uh, and it's also it's a reflection of what's going on in the whole region. Uh, there is a sense that uh, the uh, Palestinian issue, the Palestinian rights, that the Israeli-Palestinian issue is no longer uh, an issue that we should be concerned about, and that gives ammunition to the leaders to state what they do. But certainly doesn't bode well uh, for any attempt to move the peace process forward. But again, um, there are some dynamics in the Israeli society that we need to consider when we, when we talk about peace. We're gone from the old generation where the idea of having a two-state solution, despite however you want to define that, and I know it's very, very complicated, but the old generation believed that normalization meant the Israelis recognizing the Arabs and the Arabs recognizing the, Isra the Israelis, and the two together could live in peace and security. This is what some leaders, Palestinian leaders, talk about one-state solution. That generation is gone these days because of the di dynamics that change in the, the Israeli population. Okay, Lala, the French Foreign Minister said that the two-state solution is in, quote, serious danger. Do you believe that it's still possible to have two states? I mean, absolutely. It's, it's pretty much conventional wisdom by now, and I think the Israelis recognize this based on statements that a multitude of Israeli leaders have made over the past uh, few years, references to if we don't do something quick, and whatever that something is, again, is questionable, but if we don't do something quick, we're going to be faced with an apartheid-like struggle. I believe this was Shimon Peres who said this, it may have been, uh, it may have been Barack. Uh, but um, that we're going to be faced with an apartheid-like struggle for equal rights in a one democratic state. This is from, you know, Israeli leaders saying this, the Palestinian leaders recognize this, and clearly Palestinian civil society with their uh, call 10 years ago, uh, you know, this month for a global movement of boycott, divestment, and sanctions recognizes this. This is the only way, you know, be it now, be it later, you can come up with all the different peace initiatives you want. You can talk about how, uh, you know, settlement freezes, and you can talk about how uh, peace-loving Israel is, but the re reality, you know, sooner or later uh, will emerge. You can only parcel off so much more land. You can uproot so many more yep. trees. You can deny Palestinians so much more of their freedoms and rights. But ultimately, you're going to be faced with a situation where Palestinians, what they're going to be demanding is, again, right. their rights and freedoms, not bypass roads and, and different license plates and IDs that only allow you to go to certain locations. Okay. And, you know, I, I, I do just want to follow yeah. up with yeah. one thing. It's not about land 
right mm -hmm. for peace. It, you know, in reference to what he was saying, it's about which land. 42% of the West Bank right now, uh, you know, it taking into account military, you know, infrastructure, settlements, and so forth, security, yeah. so-called security zones, um, is, has eff effectively been annexed by Israel. So again, not which land, you know, yeah, disengagement from Gaza, but a retention of effective control over all of Gaza's markets of sovereignty. We haven't even addressed Gaza and how it's completely been parceled okay. off let me, let me get and isolated from yeah. the West Bank. Let yeah. me get Amos's response to that. 42% of occupied territory is occupied by, uh, of, of Palestinian territory is occupied by Israel. It's used by Israel. First of all, to answer your broader question, yeah. I absolutely do think that the two-state solution is feasible. Um, I think that while it would be uh, quite a logistical uh, endeavor to uh, relocate uh, hundreds of thousands of, of people, it is doable, it has been done. Uh, in other times in history, and parenthetically, I should say here in this context that what uh, Minister Lieberman said uh, was not, uh, at least openly, he never said that he wants to expel Arabs, he said that he wanted population exchanges by agreement of the sort that took place historically, for instance, between Greeks and Turks after World War I, or between Indians and Pakistanis after World War II. Uh, having said all this, I say that uh, a two-state solution is feasible, but the prerequisite is not about um, uh, some kind of a physical uh, remapping, uh, nor about some contractual uh, crossing of T's and dotting of I's, but about a mental um, transformation whereby, first of all, the Palestinian education system will cease to speak to its own children in a language of hate and libel, in a language of denialism, and in a language that um, dehumanizes us Israelis and, more broadly, all the Jews. This is the prerequisite. When Israelis and Jews look at all this and listen to all this rhetoric, what comes to their minds is okay. the Jews' historic experience with the medieval church, and that's an unstarter for any peace deal. Okay, I have some final questions for the two of you. That's uh, Leila, and I need some short answers because we're running out of time. Leila, the... Uh, Israel's Foreign, Minister, uh, Foreign Ministry Director General Dori Gold blames the breakdown in the peace process on Palestinian violence, and you would say? You know, the onus is never on the occupied, and the onus should never be on the oppressed, uh, but somehow that seems to be the common narrative, the fiction that Israeli leaders produce. It's, you know, it's your fault, you know, you're, we're culpable uh, in our own estranglement, in our own enslavement. Uh, and it's, again, absolutely absurd, but, but this is you know, nothing new to be expected. And I should say quickly, as a Palestinian yes. mother, I take great offense at this notion of Palestinians teach their children to hate, and somehow that is the problem. If any child learns to resent something like a military occupation and an assault, uh, what teaches them that yeah. is not their mothers. What teaches them that is 100-ton bombs dropped on their villages and their towns. It's tanks in their neighborhoods. It's the fact that okay. their own parents and grandparents are denied the right to, to return to their land. My own husband, he grew up in a refugee camp. He's unable to even visit the land of his ancestors, you know, the land of his parents and his grandparents and so forth. He can't even return to Gaza right. because yeah. Israelis continue to deny us the right of family unification. That hasn't even been addressed. They continue to control the Palestinian population registry, right. for example. Amos, let me get your response to that. Well, first of all, uh, herein lies the problem. Uh, Laila decries the results of violence, but she conveniently ignores the fact that those who introduced violence into the conflict were the Palestinians, well before Israel's establishment and well before anyone was displaced anywhere. This is the crux of the problem, the very failure to look into the facts and to the historical chronology and to assume responsibility for mistakes. For instance, is Lila prepared to say to us now, to your viewers, that the Palestinians made a mistake in 1948 when they rejected the United Nations partition resolution? That is one of the original sins of the entire conflict. Had they not made that mistake back then, which was a mistake politically and a sin morally, had they not done that, they would not have been where they are today, or rather they would not have been absent from where right. they are absent today. Is she, is she prepared to concede this? Okay, I'm afraid this is going to be a conversation that we will continue at some other time. We've run out of time here. Thanks to all of you for joining us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.